Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Pixel Feed Radio. And I have my guest here, Seema Dal. She's uh she has, she is an international speaker and branding visionary who will revolutionize the way you think about the business of personal brands. So she's an expert in personal branding, which a lot of you guys have been asking me about. So uh Seema, welcome to the show. How are you today? <laughs> you know, we we were gabbing so much so fast that I forgot to tell you how to say my name. <laughs> oh no, yeah, I know we're going. Did I did I did I butcher it because people butcher mine all the time? Yeah, so. and I wanted to ask you how you say your last name, but my first name is Sima, like similarity or Sima down. And my last name is Dahl. It rhymes with shawl. <laughs> so my accent butchered your your name then. That's what the problem is here. I'm sorry. <laughs> a lot of people say Seema because there's a Middle Eastern Indian name very similar. But uh, So tell me, how do you say yours? Lovrasich. Lovrasich. There you go. You got it. First time, right. you got it right away. So, yeah. So you actually uh, specialize on, uh, you know, personal branding strategies that empowers professionals. Uh, and a lot of people that that watch this and listen to the uh, to this are trying to build their personal brands, whether it's in digital marketing with agencies or or just you know their actual you know products. Um, so before we get into all of that and how people can grow their brands, why, why don't you tell us a little bit about your journey, where you started, how you got to where you're at today? It reminds me of this old Steve Martin movie where he says he was a poor black child and he's he's not the jerk. Not the, the, jerk yeah. <laughs> the jerk. I love the movie. I literally was this like really awkward, self-conscious kid right out of college. I mean, now I speak to audiences of thousands, but I literally couldn't look somebody in the eye, shake their hand and answer the question, what's your name? What do you do? I was just like all up in it. Um, and you know, I learned quickly that my inability to market myself was going to hold me back career-wise. So, you know, little by little, I, you know, kept stepping out of my comfort zone, had a successful career in marketing, B2B marketing, slow, complex sale, mostly high tech. And in hindsight, looking back over those first 20 years, I realized I was really fundamentally marketing myself all along to get that next job. And then when I finally went out on my own, which is another story in and of itself. Uh, those Let's hear it. People love hearing these stories, man. That's the best part about this thing, about this uh, podcast, yeah. Yeah, I was in high tech and it was volatile at best. And you know, businesses were getting acquired, they were imploding. I was a weird hybrid uh, marketer, project manager, it, just, it, it was a fascinating time, but there's a reason why I was trying to stay visible, if you will, in the stream of, of hiring managers, because, you know, I had more jobs than boyfriends. It was work someplace two years, three years, you know, and people are like, look, you move around a lot. I'm like, look, it's high tech. That's the nature of the game. Right. But um, at, at, at one point, the one of the top three largest global software companies acquired the company I worked for, which was top 10, right? So SAP swoops in, buys business objects. Once again, I'm told you're redundant headcount. And you know, once again, I'm laid off, but right. I had been working a side hustle. I had been doing marketing on the DL uh, from the comfort of my home office. And I just decided to, to keep going and see what happened. And that was 13 and a half years ago. A lot obviously happened in between, but that's the intersection at which I learned that everything I was doing to find my next job actually worked to help me find my next client. And it was just a continuous sort of evolving the way I show up in person and also online. And right now, you know, the past year, that's all we've had to, you know, make a name for myself and be memorable, be known for something. Yeah, I mean that's that's the way to go about it. That's why I do this. That's why I have the YouTube channel. I mean, it's 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 crazy like how much it changes the game. Like when, you know, when I first started doing this, uh, the, the marketing for other people, it was you know a little bit of referrals, and then when I wanted to grow, we did you know I did the whole outreach where we did cold emailing, cold outreach, phone calls, you name it, it was yep. done. And yeah, I brought results, but when you do that, the issue with that is that one, they don't know who you are. Two, you don't have a presence besides the basic, you know, stuff online. 
And three, there's no trust there. So they want like, oh, give me, you know, my favorite. It's like, well, let me talk to three of your clients, you know, as referrals. I was like, dude, if I did that, it'll be your full time. It would be my client's full time job to pick up the phone every week. Like I'm not doing right. that. You know, it's like it's private information. I can't do that. And, uh, you know, that's what made me, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, pivot to really doing a content strategy because I don't mind doing it. I just kept putting it off because I know how much work it is, <laughs> you know, That's with everything else. It's a, it's an investment. It's a commitment and you can't do it willy nilly. You have to, you know, stay consistently out there. And that takes, it takes energy, it takes effort. It takes time. And there's lots of things I'm not touching at all. I'm not doing it all that I think maybe someday soon I would love to try that. But right now it's all I can manage to do what I'm doing. It's right. A lot of work. Yeah, no, it is. And, and like, like you said, the key to it is consistency, but the payoff at the end, it's totally worth it. Yeah. If I knew, if I could have seen the, the payoff before I kept putting it off, I would have done it a lot earlier, but I was like, you know, the typical now, nah, man, content's great, but I want results now and I want them now. So I, yeah. I went the hard way about it. And now that I, you know, I've done both, I was like, man, I should have done the whole content thing from day one, you know, and that's why I tell people like content, content, content. So when you were in marketing, or well, you're still marketing, what, like what type of marketing were you? What were your 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 main uh, platforms to to help with the marketing to get results for these companies? <laughs> main platforms. We didn't call them platforms. <laughs> what what do we call them then? <laughs> we called it like, um, you know, it's funny because I got my start in high tech marketing when the internet was sort of born, when it went from, you know, wonk, educational, heavy lifting research and moved into the commercial space. I actually worked for a startup called Neoglyphics that was founded by a man named Alex Zoglin, who helped start Netscape with Mark Andreessen back in the early days at University of Illinois. So we were building out some of the very first websites, the first Sears.com, the first cars.com. And it, it was exciting. It was heady times, but it was still very much traditional B2B marketing, which is um, a content play. We did some print ads. We did some direct mail. We did um, a lot of uh, trade shows. Mm -hmm. We'd get Alex out there speaking at conferences and a lot of press releases, you know, that's really old school storytelling is get the get the people to tell your story and get uh, customers to sing your praises. We did it all that full integrated marketing communication mix, the earliest what we call email newsletters, which people kind of roll their eyes now. But, you know, back then, email newsletter marketing was brand new and exciting. It was 99% open rates. <laughs> I mean, everybody checked their email back then. It was really crazy. And, you know, a B2B marketing journey is a slow one. It's complex. And, you know, the favorite part of the conversation for me was always, you know, well, where did this lead come from? I'm like, really? We've been marketing multi, multi-platform, multi-stream, multi-channel for years to reach this guy. I don't know what finally, finally like what magic bullet hit. It's the, it's the sum total of the effort, consistent messaging, which is why when I was doing consulting and working with marketers who, who or companies who said, this didn't work. And you know, you did this one time. You can't, you think a billboard, if it doesn't generate business, like on day one, they take it down. It's just not how it works. So this, that whole idea of consistent effort over time is what I ask of my, of my personal brand clients, right? That consistent effort across touch points. When I meet you, when I experience you in meetings, at trade shows, conferences around town, and certainly online. So how do I, I mean, when I did had my own business, uh, you know, the, before the whole online thing, that's how I got started. I had background of sales, my own business, you know, I did the marketing myself, but in what I, I like, quote unquote, old school. So, you know, it was a lot of flyers, a lot of, uh, you know, print, you know, that type of stuff. And it was hard to track, but this was just me when I was doing learning. So I never worked for like a big corporation doing marketing. So I'm curious to say, uh, to, to ask, like, how did you guys track 
where the where the traffic and where the money was coming from because if you have like a billboard and then you have like a, i don't know a radio ad or a newsletter well a newsletter you can track it digitally but how yeah. did you guys track everything back then uh you know when you had to track it to present it to somebody was there like an overall uh way like a trick right now is like if you put a phone number on a billboard it's a digital phone number so if they call that number you know it come it came from that billboard right well we used to do the same thing but you would literally own it several phone numbers you know, you'd like have a one, oh, two, oh, three, <laughs> which makes sense. And then whatever that call came from, you know, it came from that specific, but that yeah, specific you know, ad or dashboard yeah. or board in your print ad, you would say, you know, code word or, or, you know, when we were online, you would take a print ad and drive it to a custom landing page and, and, you know, count those, but it, it becomes, I mean, look, there's multi-million dollar marketing systems that you can use pixels, no pun intended, and, you know, yeah. tracers and track, but, you know, for the average bear that isn't doing that level of sophisticated, you know, it's cumbersome. And it, is. it is. Well, and it is. And it takes years to look, I used to sell these kinds of softwares, where if you can't train the people how to use them, Right. It doesn't even work. So there's there's that at the enterprise level. And then there's the rest of us. Right. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, one of my one of my funniest first recollections of going solo was asking my first large client, how did you hear from me? And he said, you know, he, he mentioned somebody and I said, I don't know that person. <laughs> and he said, yeah, you dated him in high school or something. I was like, what? <laughs> That was like 28 years ago. So, and it was, it was a true story and it made me realize how does that guy know who I am and what I do today? Like for crying out loud, my name's changed. And it, it was through social, through social platforms, you know, staying top of mind and, and letting people know what you're up to is powerful. It really is. So now let's walk through, um, you know, what your process is like and how you work with these clients. So when somebody comes to you or, you know, whether it's an individual or company and they, and they go, listen, I want to work on my personal brand. I, I want to grow. Like, what is your process like? So let's say I have no idea how to do this and I come <laughs> to you. What is it? How does that, pro how, what is your process to, to get it going? Like, how does it start? Like, sure. Walk me through it. It does, it does actually vary by customer because I either get hired to teach personal branding as a function of social selling to sales teams. So we really look at their target buyer, what it is they sell, the keywords. So there's a, a difference right from this, the get-go. If, if I'm getting hired to teach high potential talent in the enterprise how to market themselves as a retention strategy, like – you know, your best players, you can't have them quit because they can't get ahead, but they don't know how to get ahead. The larger the company, the worse it is. So yeah. that's a different kind of body of work versus the individual client who says, I've got a business or I'm stuck in my career or I do want to make that pivot. And then there's the association clients who want me to entertain all manner of a, of a different audience that's coming from all those directions. So for me, the first decision is what's the end game? What does success look like? Let's let's define that and then work back to the behaviors that lead to that. So I'll use a, a recent example. A private client works in a FINRA a SEC regulated space in, in wealth advisory, and it's really difficult. Because oh, my, my best friend. To do all the things. And I said, so you're going to eat. So let me get this straight. You're going to start a podcast, but you can't let anybody know you're doing a podcast. What? So you're going to send an email. How often do you email? Four times a year. Who's it go to? Current customers. Oh, my gosh. So, you know, it's different. <laughs> what? So you have to think versus, you know, I'm kicking off a social selling, like a, a, a multi-session training that we're creating for on-demand uh, you know, for long-term training and education. And these guys sell uh, through the channel. So we have to think about how do you stay top of mind through channel partners who ultimately move, move products. So we really, I know it sounds like it's overcomplicated. It's not. What's the end goal? What, you know, tools are within your reach? What works? At the end of the day, 99% of my clients say, I want more referrals. 
you know, right. the, the corporate, the corporate go getter who literally wants somebody to knock on their door and say, you know what? Nobody knows this yet, but we're making an acquisition or so-and-so just gave her notice. And I'd really love for you to go for that job or help me lead the tap. How does that person get tapped? Tapped for something amazing? It's because they've been working it and they're known for something. They're known as somebody who follows through, has expertise that can lead. That's the magic of personal branding on the job. Yeah, it's so funny that you that you bring that up about the the financial advisor, the wealth advisor. My best friend since we were like 13 years old, he's a wealth advisor. <laughs> and he just like every time we get together, he he just like, dude, I'm so jealous. I, I can't do any of it. I'm because of course he's my best friend. I'm like, dude, anything you need, I'll help you. I'll do it for you. And he's like, nope, can't do that. Nope, can't do that. Nope, can't do that. Because financial is so restricted when it's they so can do. Every brokerage is different. So the yeah. bigger they are, like the household names. The oh, he works for a pretty bigger. big one that if I'll say yeah. the name, everybody knows what it is. Yeah. The littler, more nimble ones are like, well, let's let's push that boundary. But yeah, it's it's fascinating. You know, their hands are really tied. And at the end of the day, if you ask them to make a list where your best clients come from, your last dozen clients come, referrals. So you still have to do the work. It's just going to be a slower slower rowing of the boat because you can't leverage the platforms i'm still laughing that you call them platforms we call them channels <laughs> i i just call i mean i'm just so used to saying platforms that's what i call it you know i mean i deal with them every day oh, so, i also really appreciate that you said back in the day how did you measure like let's i'm not that old <laughs> hey listen i'm no young child here you know it's like i, I was I, I was a teenager when the internet was invented so it's like well That's not invented but when it became public with like aol right i mean right. so i trust me i'm not young spring chicken myself yeah so I, I, I remember the sound of dial up like i can hear that sound if I think oh my god yeah the modem yeah i totally remember i used to get yelled at by my parents like Get off the phone! I'm trying to get online, <laughs> you know. Right. So that's why I was curious because I, I mean, I tell you right now, even then, I remember sitting there in the quote unquote the computer room of the house because you know back then we had a computer room, right? Uh, and uh, I remember it was like giant. Yeah, yeah, and I remember sitting there. I'm like, man, this is so cool. Like, I want to do something with the internet, but I don't know what. And then you know, I kept growing, and then girls, yeah. cars, you know, and then got sidetracked for a good, yeah, I don't know. 15 years, you know, well, college I, was, and all that. I was that young, lucky person that was working in the thick, the thick of the start, the heady startup days. Now I wasn't on either coast. I was here in the Silicon Prairie in Chicago. So that was like a little, you know, a little hindering, but you know, think about beer Friday on the roof, beanbag chairs and pinball. And on the first nice day of spring, we'd go to lunch and never come back. Because, that's awesome. You know, like, I, mean, I mean, I was there for that. And that's just, those are precious memories. And we've learned a lot since then, but we continue to learn. Like now we're all about what are you doing on Clubhouse? You know, it's yeah. all something. Yeah, no. And uh, I tell people all the time too, like, listen, like, Again, I'm going to call it platform or channels. Yeah. Uh, listen, the platforms or the channels can change and can, and can evolve, you know, as the technology gets better. But my principles of marketing are still, quote unquote, the old school ones that I learned from people like Dan Kennedy or Absolutely. like, you know, those guys that are like the, five, you know, Ogilvy and, uh, you know, Gary Herbert, you know, those guys, the, the OG, what I call the OG copywriters. Yeah. Because everything that's new now, guess what? It came from those guys. And Dan Kennedy's still in his basement pumping out marketing for like big ass companies and charging $20,000 for a five minute call. So listen, that's that's what you got to get in your head. How you put it out there, it doesn't matter. That's just the technology. And yeah. that's what people don't seem to understand. And I'm sure when you're, when you're approaching these clients and when you're working with these people to build their personal brands, I mean, the basics still the same no matter how much times have changed, correct? Well, absolutely. So I literally just minutes before joining you was delivering a, a virtual workshop for a women's group inside a large enterprise. So, you know, um, they have uh, business resource groups for different pockets of employees and it's meant to help them grow their careers. It's, a re it's at the end of the day, everything's a retention strategy, right? Keep your best people. And we were talking about confident communications, leaning into conversations and sharing your opinion, speaking up. You know, and then how do you do that differently 
in a, in a large enterprise in an online setting where the rules are unclear and do you butt in, do you use chat? Like, but you still need to lean in and weigh in if anybody's to know that you even exist, let alone what you're good at, right? So we still have to figure that out. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, let me ask you something else. So for those of, of the, the people that are listening or watching right now, and they're, you know, starting out and, you know, and they're trying to to grow their, their personal brand, what, how would you tell them to start? What, what is the first thing that they should do and how they should go about it? What, what are the, the steps that you recommend they do to get started, to get to a level where they can grow their company or they can hire somebody like you or hire you, should I say, uh, <laughs> at some point to help them take them to the next level? Sure. I have a framework. I, it's very simple. It's uh, four E's that define your personal brand versus your essence, E, essence. Like what are you instinctively good at? What lights you up? Hopefully that's in line with the work you do, right? Because it's so much easier to build a powerful personal brand when you're excited about who you are and what you do. So we really take a minute to dial back into what, what, how are you wired? What, literally, because you can, the example just an hour ago, people at this company have the title brand manager, there's maybe 30 of them with that same title, but they're not the same people. They don't have the same interest. They don't do the work the same way. So you've got to really figure out you and then your expression, E expression. How do you articulate your personal brand value? The value of what you know, where you've been, where you're going. To the buyer, there's always a buyer. Always. We are complex sales people. So if we don't know who we're trying to market to and what the value they see. So in a corporation, if you're in marketing, what's your domain? What's your expertise? Are you driving leads? Are you driving page hits? Are you driving, um, you know, whatever the metric is, it ultimately comes down to something you can measure. And it's usually tied to money. Right, because it's really difficult to make a personal brand, and I help people feel good or laugh more. Okay, but when people feel good or laugh more, maybe they take fewer sick days, and that's the bottom line story. You got to get to that story. Third E is enrollment. Once you have your expression, your essence, how do you enroll others into that personal brand story? And that's all the tactical stuff that you and I enjoy teaching so much. Right? How do you create create um, uh, your online digital footprint. What is the way you introduce yourself? I call it your airplane pitch. Like, do you use your job title? Do you say, my name is Simadol, president, founder, and CEO of Sway Factory, Inc. What? <laughs> Nobody needs any of that. You don't even know what my first name is when I'm done with that. Right? So how do you introduce yourself? How do you stay on brand? Offline, online, all of that. And then the fourth E is evolution because you have to keep an eye as demand changes. So for example, I've been talking about personal brands since forever. That's my whole business is, is pinned on that. But in the first half of my business, people thought that was fluff. It was, you know, what do you mean I'm gonna pay you to teach me that? Like what? Get out. So it took me a little bit longer because I couldn't use that phrase. And then ultimately, when the phone starts ringing and people use that language, I know I can use the language. And so now I talk about personal branding, whereas before it was maybe more um, leadership, talent acquisition, talent retention, um, you know, social selling even was dicey for a long time. And now we all know what that means. So using the language that the buyer understands adds value. And the, all the work happens in all those stages. Yeah. And now that this past year, obviously with COVID and all that, everything has shifted in terms of going online and, you know, uh, brick and mortar and all that stuff. And even like people in sales. So how has, has everything in the past year shifted, you know, the way you, you teach these things or how has changed the, the way you look at things and, and how you teach people and take advantage of, you know, taking online and going full online because I'm sure, you know, before it was a, a mixture, I'm assuming of, uh, it was a mixture. Rates yeah. really expensive to bring 500 salespeople together for a conference. And then even when you do that, 
You don't stick them in a room and jam eight hours of training down their throat because that's not how you affect lasting change. So since the very inception of my business, I've been doing hybrid speaking and training, online, offline, creating courses for on-demand playback, private for clients. What's next for me is creating public courses. But even too, when you have a large enterprise and you're offering programs to staff, they're, you're not going to fly them all in. And what happens if they take a sick day that day or they have an emergency? They miss it? No. So we would do it live on site and then we do a hybrid version online and record that again for on-demand playback. So I've always been working that way. This just limited my ability to go and do those fun kickoffs and meet people, shake their hand, let them feel a little bit of my energy, which is what got me started looking at podcasts. I'm not ready to start my own. <laughs> <laughs> just do it. <laughs> I'm telling you, just do it. I'll call you and you can help me. But um, yeah, sure. Showing up and being me, where I know I can add value, like to your listening audience, it was was a win for me. So I also doubled down on my involvement in trade associations and conferences because I wouldn't go to the occasional meeting. It didn't. There weren't any. So I got on committees. I joined the Membership Experience Committee, the National Speakers Association. I got involved with the American Marketing Association again after years. Um, and I continue to, to speak and teach through my Toastmasters organization. So I'm trying to show up and do me as much as possible. Yeah, it's like it's the old saying that you don't you, you don't join a country club just to go play golf. You can play golf anywhere. It's, you join a country club for the connections inside that country That's club. Right. <laughs> and I mean, I'm listen. I'm in a I'm in a weird position because most of the people that do what I do, they're completely introverts, which I find hilarious because they have to be. You know, it's all about marketing. Right. But I've been an extrovert my whole life, and ever since I shifted everything to digital like a decade ago. It's been so hard for me because, uh, you know, I grew up in sales and I had sales teams and I used to like teach them. And, and right. let's face it, man, sales people were a bunch of savages when you let us out in the room. So, right. you know, uh, like I miss those things. I really do. Like this whole like pandemic being locked up, uh, you know, not being able to do this it has really, really done a number on me because it's like I feel, you know, like locked up. And I'm sure a lot of the people that are in sales and marketing that you deal with, they're in that same boat of like not being able to be, go out and, and show their energy. And that's really tough yeah. to bring it online, right? Yeah, my industry, I mean, you know, all things hospitality and education, when you think about, okay, now there's no big conferences, there's no big trade shows, there's no, uh, you know, even Vistage meetings. I'm a Vistage speaker and, I, and I've been to, two of those in person they're all hybrid they're all online and um i can't wait for the for the tides to turn but what this last year has taught me is a bit more balance and scale with all things digital there's exponential reach and scale which is why i encourage just the humble status update once a week on linkedin people think they got to update their status 30 times a day because that's the way their cousin is on Facebook. No, once a week, every seven to 10 days, get on LinkedIn and let your network know what you're up to and be on brand and use those keywords and stay in the stream. Because if you're just heads down, chained to your desk, you're not working on your personal brand. Yeah, you, you take it a lot easier than I do. I'll be like five times a day. <laughs> I was like, create content for five times a day. But no, it's tough when you're doing it uh, personally for yourself. But, you know, once you expand, you can get tools and, and people. Which also, people you. can keep up with all your updates there. They're not on LinkedIn that much and they don't want to be reading your backlog. I, I, you know, I'm literally, I teach once every seven to 10 days and let it hang. Let people catch up to you. And as you continue that week over week, you'll see tremendous reach. Now, I fell off the wagon in October, right around my birthday, October, November, December, January, were really personally difficult for me. I can't put my finger on it other than to say, politics, COVID, business, blah, I just, everybody was angry and screaming and I needed to time out. So right. I had to pull up my big girl pants and go, okay, gotta get back in the game. 
Yeah, and that's that's the that's the that's what you got to do sometimes. You just got to deal with it. I mean, at that time it was difficult for everybody, I think, because I got sick of. I have to be in there. <laughs> I was sick of seeing all that stuff. So, but right. anyway, so we're out of time already. This flew by, but listen, thank you so much for coming on. Where can people find you if they want to, you know, work with you? Where where can they go? Simadol.com. Super easy. First and last name on LinkedIn. My you know, early days when we were just literally launching LinkedIn, I thought it would be funny to create the name Sima Says. You know, so my LinkedIn URL is Sima Says. So then so is my Twitter and so is my Instagram. I thought that was funny. It's not really. It's just- <laughs> no, but it's hey, it's easy yeah. to, to remember when you look at it. It's congruent. That's what matters. Yeah. 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 So for those of you watching and listening, all the links will be down in the description. And again, Sima, thank you so much for coming on. I had a great time. Thank you. Until next time.